Hey everyone. Just waiting here for a couple minutes. Hey everyone. Welcome. Hello, hello. Hey Eric. <clears throat> Hi. <laughs> hey. Welcome. Just looking for the link here. Ah, I see we have some of our peer mentors here. Hey guys, how's it going? Pretty good, how about you? Good, thanks. Joy, Victoria, Claudia, thanks for being here. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. I just sent through a link on the chat box. I'm not sure if you're able to click on that and see if it works for you guys. Yeah, that works. Great. Just give it a couple more minutes. How have you been, Sahil? Sahil. Sahil, correct? Sahil, yeah. I've been good. Um, getting busy with work and stuff and um, crazy to see the weather outside. I'm sure it's even crazier where you guys are. Um, but yeah, that and watching plenty of basketball, which is a welcome distraction. Right. <clears throat> what about you both? <laughs> um, well, the weather is insane, so. I'm getting a cabin fever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm actually um, starting a boot camp with UC Berkeley today. So I'm a little nervous about that, but very excited at the same time. Sounds fun. What is it about? Data analysis, data and analytics. I can never say that word, data analytics. <laughs> Numbers, we'll call it. Numbers. <laughs> Good stuff numbers. with numbers. <laughs> cool. <clears throat> Erica, how's everything going on your end? Everything's good. Um, yeah, it's just been very, very smoky and dark the past two days. Um, but things are moving along smoothly. Just, you know, feeling like I'm living in Hotel Transylvania. <laughs> yep. There was a really funny quote on... Um, on Twitter, I think it was something like, humans are making Earth look like Mars faster than we can make Mars look like Earth, which was yeah. <laughs> maybe yeah. reflect a little bit. <laughs> Definitely a lot of Mars memes going around right now. Yeah. yeah. Cool, we'll give it just a minute or two. I'm gonna start sharing. Hi, Laura. I see Laura's on here too. Great. And Rose, yeah. Ro. I'm muted because I'm eating a very late lunch, but Hi. <laughs> I'll come on as soon as I'm oh. done. <laughs> no worries. Food is important. Hey, Ro, how's it going? Hi, good in yourself? Good. Oh, there it is. Thanks for being here. <laughs> yeah, of course. Good to be here. Hi. Well, Hill, I'm not sure if you've um, been formally introduced to Rosea before, but uh, she's our STARS program uh, project manager. 
Oh, great. Hi. Hey, Hi. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Been Excited been to work together. Yeah. Our mentor program. Gotcha. Glad you guys finally get to meet. Yeah, we should definitely discuss at some point. Lots of cool stuff in the works, I'm sure. Yes. Absolutely. All right, give it one more minute. <clears throat> and then uh, Naomi and, sorry, not Naomi, Erica and Eric, um, feel free to, if you need to say stuff at the top, um, feel free to do so. And then I'll introduce myself um, a little bit later on. <clears throat> And by the way, just as a heads up to everyone, this call will be recorded and made available to NDNU after the fact. Did you say you wanted to get started right now? Oh, uh, we can give it a minute. Okay. <laughs> All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? First and foremost, I wanna thank everybody for being here today. Um, this is a very exciting new chapter for NDNU um, with partnership with Sawhill and um, the Career Launchpad. Um, I hope that you all take advantage of everything that he has to offer because he's been in the game for quite a while and he knows exactly what he's talking about. So, um, Thank you. I, I really do hope you take advantage of it. Yeah, and uh, thanks, Eric. And um, I also like to thank all the students for being here today and taking advantage of the opportunity. Um, you know, this is the first webinar of a long series of all year. Um, as Sahil mentioned, it will be recorded. So we appreciate you being present. Um, in the future, if you ever can't attend a webinar, they'll be made available to you on the website. Um, and like Eric said, we're really excited about this opportunity and partnership with the STARS Project um, and um, with our career services. So we appreciate Sahil for being here. Um, him and his brother Rohan have put together a really nice setup for you guys um, and discussing career development, which is I'm sure on a lot of your minds, I know it was on mine when I was a student, um, you know, what happens next post-graduation. And so we're really um, excited for you to be here to be able to not only take away the content that you are finding in the modules themselves, but also being able to be here and ask direct questions um, and get that follow-up um, with Sahil. So thank you all and I'll pass the mic over to Sahil now. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. So just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Sahil Panamia. Um, I graduated from undergrad back in 2013 um, and have a career in entertainment. I work at Netflix today as part of the marketing strategy team. So love my day job in entertainment, but my nights and weekends kind of passion is helping college students specifically um, build their career. I think I experienced a lot of weird uh, situations when I was recruiting for my first job and internship in college. I'm sure you guys can relate to sending an application out to like dozens of places, never hearing back, or that weird chicken and egg scenario of, oh, you need two to four years of work experience for this entry level job. It's like, how do you get around those things, right? Uh, and so I think what, what I've learned with my brother, who's also felt the same thing, is the traditional way of looking for a job is officially broken. And unfortunately, it's not gonna get fixed anytime soon. And so what my brother and I, what our mission is, is to train college students on how to look for a job the right way and how to think about building your career across your 20s, your 30s and beyond by using some of the principles that we're gonna discuss. So as Erica kind of mentioned, what we're doing today is kind of a kickoff webinar. So this is the first of nine monthly webinars. Each webinar is going to touch on a deeper topic that we, we, that we discussed in the course. And so basically the way to look at it is these monthly webinars are going to be a good supplement, a forum for you to ask questions to me um, that you have after kind of watching the course modules and, and um, experiencing some of the advice yourself. 
Now, for those of you who might not know what the heck is this course, um, I've linked it out on the chat box on the right-hand side. Um, you can click on that to get access. If you have issues, you can reach out to me over email and we'll get you sorted. The way you think about this course is it's your one-stop resource. It's a playbook of how to go from not knowing what you wanna do to landing your dream job or internship and everything in between. We're talking resume and cover letter advice, how to reach out to professionals, cold emailing, how to decide what you want to do. It really is your one-stop shop resource. And normally, and I'll mention this at the end, uh, we have students every day paying upwards of $300 each for course access. And what NDNU has graciously been able to do through the grant program is make this uh, available to everyone uh, for free. And so this is definitely something that you guys all want to take advantage of. And I'm here to help make sure that everyone sees the career success that they want. Uh, and Laura, I'm pasting it in right now again. Let me know if you can see that. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Again, any issues, I'm going to send my email address again as well. So that's a little bit about the program that we're doing together with NDNU. Um, and at any time uh, you have access to my email, um, there is also a Facebook group that we started called the Career Launchpad Collective. If you are enrolled in the course, you can request to join the Facebook group. You'll receive an automatic notification that you're eligible to join the Facebook group. And that's kind of your forum to ask questions anytime you want. We do additional group coaching calls there on a weekly, bi-weekly basis. So really trying to give you guys all the support you need uh, to really make your, your first career move. So with that, I'm going to go into the actual presentation. As a reminder to those who just joined, this call will be recorded and made available to NDNU students after the fact who couldn't join today. Um, and Erica or Eric, if you could be so kind and let me know if there are questions that pop up in the chat um, so that way I can stop and answer them. We will also have a separate Q&A at the very end of this call in case you guys have questions. All right, so. Cool. Can everyone see my screen here? Awesome. All right, so let's get started. So a couple things we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to give you an introduction, a little bit more about why we put this course together, then tell you some of my backstory and then get into actually the presentation, the good stuff while you're here, uh, and then wrap up with a quick conclusion. So our goal for you today is quite simple. It's to have everything you need to find your next job or internship immediately even if you don't have any prior experience. And yes, this includes competitive careers for those of you who wanna do things like finance, healthcare, entertainment, data science, engineering, and everything in between. This is an approach that works universally. So let's first take a moment to acknowledge just how broken the traditional recruiting process is. I'm sure many of you can relate to this. According to Glassdoor, the average job posting today gets upwards of 250 applications. If you're applying to a really brand name company like Google or Facebook, this is actually four to five X. So it could be upwards of a thousand applications per job uh, posting. From that big stack of applications, only five, basically four to six people get an interview, as you would imagine, and one student gets the offer. That's a 0.4% offer rate, right? So, so yikes. And then and, and the question is, is did that one person just have a really good resume or, or what really went on? And, and what Rohan and I have learned over the years is it actually doesn't matter how good or bad your resume is. Yes, you want to have it in the best format possible, but what really matters is how to break out from the rest of the people in the application stack by networking, um, by showing your curiosity, because essentially what you're doing as a college student, you're not really selling your experience. I mean, think about it. You might have studied a very difficult major. You obviously graduated from a great university, but you know you might have one or two internships under your belt. But if you really think about it, I'm sure many of you would agree that you don't really have any underlying skill sets to offer right away. And that's totally fine because you're at the beginning of your career. Now, what you are selling is your potential. So whenever you talk to professionals, when you're in an interview, what you're actually selling is not your skill sets today, it's your potential tomorrow. And it's up to you to demonstrate why you're worth someone investing into. Because if you think about it, when you first start at any type of company, they're gonna have to pour hours of training, you know, tens of thousands of dollars and just training and, and having other employees help you. So you're really kind of a blank slate. So I think that the common misunderstanding with students of the traditional recruiting process is, oh, I need you know, as much experience as possible to get that first job. Is experience helpful? Of course. But is it something that you're actually selling yourself to and for employers? Not really specifically for your first career move after college. Obviously, after that, experience is everything. Um, but for now, I want you to focus on how can you communicate your potential? And we're going to talk a little bit about that later on in the presentation. 
Additionally, we know that it takes on average three to six months for a student to find a job after graduating. Um, think about not only how long that is, but how much foregone wages you go through, right? If the average student makes around $50,000 a year, you're basically missing out on up to half of that just because you haven't started the search sooner. So for those of you who are still in college, which is great, and you're, recent, you're listening to this webinar, you're going to be way ahead of the curve. If you're a freshman through junior, then you're going to even be even more ahead. So uh, whether you're watching this live or after the fact, just know that you want to get ahead of this so that you don't miss out on any wages, you don't miss out on cool experiences, and just making as much progress as you can with your career. And of course, we all know that COVID-19 has made the situation even worse. We all know the headlines that are coming up. I'm sure it's not comforting to any of you, but relax, I have an approach that works for you. So this approach is going to be COVID proof. It's even uh, proof through any kind of recession. So, all right, and, and just a note here, our approach requires you to work both smart and hard. Uh, we're gonna give you the smart strategies today and just you need to commit to doing the hard work. What you don't need is, you know, parents who have an extensive network, you don't need uh, a super fancy education, or you don't need a lot of money to, to make this work. What you just need is, is determination and just putting these steps into practice and you will see the results guaranteed. All right, so let me go quickly into my story and, and why I think I'm even credible to, to tell you guys how to do this, because I'm sure you're wondering. Um, so my brother who couldn't be here today, you'll see him eventually, um, his name's Rohan and he is currently a product manager at LinkedIn. Uh, and he successfully navigated, you know, a very competitive university, UC Berkeley, found internships, all of his internships listed below at Disney, at Levi's, those were all found through cold emailing. So he never just applied and, and got it. He actually had to network his way in. And of course, transitioning from a business professional to a product professional at one of the leading companies in tech, um, he's been able to come up with a way to do that. Um, so even though, you know, him and I are a couple of years removed from undergrad, these are the principles that are actually going to help you later on in your career. So we're not just showing you how to find your first job out of college, we're showing you how to find your subsequent jobs later on in life. And then of course myself, um, I graduated from UCLA, uh, worked in management consulting for a couple of years and worked at Discovery Channel, watching cute cat and dog videos all day. That was fun. And uh, now I work at Netflix for a little over two and a half years doing marketing strategy. So both Ron and I have had really fun and amazing careers and uh, everything that we're talking about today are, are tools that we actually use um, to, to have success. And actually my brother couldn't be here, but his birthday's tomorrow. And uh, he actually was able to negotiate a what was it? It ended up being a $40,000 raise just yesterday using one of the modules uh, that's included in the career launch pad, the, the salary negotiation module. So he got a nice birthday present. And of course, these are all things that are totally available to you if you follow the program. So a little bit more about myself. Uh, I am a marching band nerd. That's me on the left hand side. Um, I'm basically a, big into music. Uh, music was a big part of my life. I actually got into UCLA through the back door. Um, so I applied in high school and didn't get in on the right hand side. You'll see that letter that I got. And uh, a couple weeks later after getting rejected, the music director at UCLA saw a clip of me on YouTube playing the saxophone. And he was like, you know what? Why don't you audition for the marching band? And I was like, I never got in. What do you mean? I'm not admitted to the university. He's like, don't worry about that. Just submit the audition tape and we'll see if you can be eligible. And um, I gave the audition and long story short, he was able to make it work because I had the grades my senior year to show that I've been improving. And so I kind of got in through the back door. Now, as you can imagine, if you guys think back to your first day on campus, um, it was a blessing and a curse. Getting into my dream school was awesome, but being surrounded by 35,000 other students, UCLA is a big campus, who on paper, more smarter than me and more likely to succeed. So forget finding a job. How was I gonna survive in class as a freshman? And I really kind of struggled with this uh, imposter syndrome, this feeling that I wasn't good enough. And towards the end of my freshman year, I started to change my approach. Instead of spending all day in the library, freaking out by myself, trying to study and compete with others, I, I kind of had a mindset change. I said, you know what, I'm surrounded by all these smart people. Why not try to learn from them and have them help me tackle challenges alongside them instead of competing against them? So I started joining group study groups. I went to professor office hours. I started joining a lot more student groups and taking leadership positions and really participating and engaging in the community rather than just being a competitor by myself. So I would ask all of you today, as you look forward to your uh, academic year in the coming year, whether you're a senior or you have a couple years ahead of you, um, what ways are you engaging with the NDA 
the NU community? And are you really making best use of all the incredible intellect that's around you, even in a virtual setting? So really joining student groups was a big way for me to start learning from older students. And that came really handy when it came time to actually recruit for an internship or a job. And that's the right-hand side image here. Uh, my, intern my junior year summer, I was able to intern at a company called LEK Consulting, which is listed right over here, if you can see. And it was listed on Glassdoor's top 25 most difficult companies to interview with in the country. So all the principles that I'm going to show you today have been battle-tested in some of the most competitive environments you can imagine. And I ultimately got a full-time job offer after that summer internship my junior year. So my senior year, I didn't have to do anything. I had a six-figure full-time job waiting for me uh, when I graduated. So these tips, again, work for really competitive careers like management consulting and technology. So we're super excited to make them available to everyone. And of course, one of the fun emails that I got during my junior year internship training was uh, a note to all the students who were admitted uh, for our summer training in Boston. And uh, this was kind of a, a shocker moment for me. I got this email and I looked at everyone else who was CC'd and I was like, what was I doing in the sea of Ivy League students from MIT, Dartmouth and Harvard and Stanford? I was like, I was a backdoor admit to UCLA, which is a great institution, but it was kind of a shocker and it really validated a lot of the work that I put in um, as a student. So it was really fun to see myself been able to elevate to, to the very extreme level of uh, performance in the business world. Okay, so let's get into the presentation. I'm gonna pause here to see first if we have any questions. I don't think so. Can you guys see the video at the bottom of my screen right now? No. Okay, cool. We'll keep going. So let's get into the presentation. So here's what we're going to cover today, the five-step process. Number one, we're going to talk about how to overcome the anxiety about figuring out your dream career. So for those of you who have no idea what you want to do, or maybe you have some kind of an idea, but you're not quite sure, we're going to talk about how to overcome that. In step two, we're going to learn the secret to landing interviews without any prior work experience. So as I mentioned before, if you're tired of the meme of, oh, you need tons of years of experience for this entry level position, we're going to show you how to get around that. In step three, I'm going to show you how to network your way to 10x your career and why most students get networking totally wrong. In step four, I'm going to show you how to get other people to stamp your job application as a must interview. If you remember the pile of 250 resumes, how do you make yourself stand out? This is the way to do it. And then in step five, which tends to be the most favorite for, for students, is how do, you, how do you actually nail interviews? So for those of you who are nervous, um, are not sure about making that solid first impression, we're going to give you some tips to actually nail the interview out of the park and just have fun so you can stand out from the competition. All right, so let's talk about step one, overcoming anxiety to figure out your dream career. So in this step, you're gonna transform in the following way, going from no idea where to start your career search to having a, an idea of your career hypothesis about where to start. So to start off, you're probably wondering, what is a career hypothesis? It's simply a best guess at what you aspire to do as a professional. Now, why are we just guessing? Consider the following. Finding your dream job is actually a process that happens gradually over decades through process of elimination. You know, you, you kind of think, you know, as you do internships and jobs, there are certain things that you like, certain things that you don't like, and you gradually refine into doing things more that you like. We're all at the beginning of our career, so we don't really have the ability to pick everything that we like right away. We're going to have to start trying something. Furthermore, consider that according to the BLS, the average person changes jobs 11 times between the ages of 18 to 49. That's once every two and a half years. So the days of our parents, for those of you who had parents working here in the US um, for the same company for like 30 to 50 years, those days are gone. Um, and so basically, I'm sure a lot of you can relate. Um, you know, you want to move to, to a good fast paced company, maybe you want to work for a startup, you want to try a new interesting role, we're a lot more mobile now. And so I think this is just the new way of looking for your career is rapid succession. And then think about how many times you've thought about changing your major, right? I, I went from music to engineering to business and accounting, then to econ and film, which is what I ended up with. Um, and so the amount of times that you change your major is a perfect indicator of how many times you might change your career. Um, uh, ignoring the fact that you've only been in college for four years or two years and your career is like a 40, 50 year span. So you're going to change your mind a couple of times. And then lastly, um, and a cool note is, is both Rohan and my job didn't even exist 10 years ago. 
Uh, Rohan is actually the product manager in charge of the job seeker platform on LinkedIn. So he actually manages that entire process of LinkedIn jobs marketplace. So all the stuff we're going to tell you today is based on what's going on in the real world. And then my job at Netflix, as you guys can imagine, 10 years ago, Netflix was a very different company than what it is today. And so my, my entire team didn't even exist. So the point here is that all of you are entering a really, really interesting time in the economy, not only with COVID, but so many cool companies are coming up and who knows what the world's going to look like in 2030 and 2040 and beyond, right? Especially with the changes going on today. So the point of this is to take off the stress of needing to figure out, I need to know exactly what I want to do for the next 40 years. There's no such thing. The most important thing is that you start somewhere and you start doing and taking action and start learning about yourself and your interests, even if it's one simple internship or one conversation. And over time, you're gonna get closer and closer to your goal. So again, process of elimination by just simply taking a guess and then working towards the stuff that you like. So what we wanna do here is actually create a career hypothesis. And a good career hypothesis is two parts. Number one, the type of role. And number two, the type of industry. So here's a couple examples. Number one, I think I want to become a product manager in the technology industry. Uh, number two, I think I want to become a digital marketer in the makeup industry. Or the last one, I think I want to become a healthcare provider in the sports industry. So note the two factors, right? It's like the role, which is in blue, like product manager, digital marketer, healthcare provider. And then there's the actual application or the industry of it, right? Um, because you can be a healthcare provider at a university setting uh, for a nonprofit. So there's different flavors, right? Um, and then thirdly, notice how all of these statements start with, I think. And I really want you to use this phrase for your own career hypothesis. So start saying things like, I think I want to do X in the Y industry. And it really gives yourself permission to just take a wild guess and not have to be 100% certain in what you want to do. So uh, what I'd like to do right now is to take a minute to think about your career hypothesis. Just some context here. This is an exercise I do probably a couple times a year because things are always changing for me. So obviously in the next minute, you're not going to find out your entire career journey for the next couple of years, but this is more so just a, a taste of what it's like. In the real world, what you want to do maybe after this webinar is look at this slide again in the recording or in the Launchpad module. You'll have a lot more detail on how to do this and, and really spend maybe half an hour just thinking about based on your prior experiences, what are some things you want to do? So I'm going to pause here for 30 seconds, take a water break, and uh, why don't you all think about your career hypothesis? All right, so maybe you got somewhere far, maybe you didn't, it's totally okay. Uh, you, you can kind of continue to think about it after this. Okay, so now that we have a career hypothesis, it's time to see if we're correct about the hypothesis. You know, if in science you have a hypothesis, then you test it out. So how are we gonna test it out? The answer is by making ourselves sound like industry experts. <clears throat> so that's step two. Learn the secret to landing jobs without any prior experience. So in this step, you're going to transform in the following way. Go from knowing nothing about your target industry to being an industry expert. Now, those of you who are probably wondering right now, there's two ways to become an expert. I think option one is clear to all of us. Um, you have a career hypothesis in front of you. Like the, the most logical thing is to just go out and get years of work, extensive work experience, right? Like I think I want to become a digital marketer in the makeup industry. All right, let me go find an internship, a job, and, and try that for a couple of years. That's one way. It's a very hard way to try it out. There's actually an easier way that just came up, I would say about 20 years ago, which actually isn't that long in the grand scheme of things, which is conducting your own research online. Um, what happened is there's so much information available online to all of us, and we're not really using it in the best way because it sounds so intuitive. And when I show you guys how to do this, it's going to sound so simple, but no student is doing this. And there's so much research available to you for free that you can really make yourself sound like an industry expert and quickly learn whether your career hypothesis is interesting to you or not. So as I mentioned before, right now our goal is to test out our career hypothesis as fast as possible. So we value speed over comprehensiveness. What do I mean by this? If you look at these two options, 
you know, of course, if you're going to actually work in the makeup industry for five years, you're going to have a pretty darn good idea of what it's like to work in the industry. But think about how much time it'll take you to actually get that experience. It's not easy, right? It's going to take you some effort. Um, on the other hand, look at option two. We can just spend a week or two researching as much as we can about the digital marketing industry in the makeup space. And we can get pretty darn smart about what it's like to be in that industry and then go ahead and commit to option one. So the point of this is to use option two to quickly figure out if our career hypothesis is correct so that we can commit more time and focus to option one. So there's only two possible outcomes after testing your career hypothesis by doing online research. Either you were wrong and need to change your focus. So maybe you were like, well, I like digital marketing, but I don't really like the makeup industry. So let me look to apply it somewhere else. Um, or your hypothesis was correct and you can get more specific. Like, um, oh, I was doing a lot of research on the makeup industry in digital marketing and I really love it. I'd love to work for one of those startup companies on Instagram, or I'd love to work for a big company like Sephora or Ulta. Like you can see yourself getting more specific now, right? Now you're getting super targeted, which is really cool. But again, it's a process of gradual refining. So, so no stress. I think you just wanna make sure that you're on the right track and you're interested in, in what you're researching. That's the key thing. So how do we do this research? Here are some resources you can use, Google, Google News, a website called Quora, which is really fun place for people to ask questions. Surprisingly, Reddit is a great resource, especially for those of you in STEM who want to do computer science or things like that. And actually, my favorite of all is YouTube. I don't know about you, but I hate reading long articles and textbooks. So I love like explainer videos that people post like five to 10 minute really cool videos on like, what is product management? Uh, what does it mean to be a healthcare provider in the COVID-19 era? Like there's so many cool videos that show up that really teach you about careers that we're not really exposing ourselves to. So let me go into more de detail because I'm pretty sure telling you to Google search stuff is not satisfying. <laughs> so let me show you the, the magic behind this. So on the left-hand side here is a snippet of what I did a Google search for. So let's say again, we're gonna use a makeup industry example just for illustration. And I searched digital advertising trends 2020. Now here's a trick in Google, whatever industry or, or role you want, enter that in Google and then follow it up with trends and then either the current year 2020 or the previous year 2019. And what you'll see is you'll start to see these results pop up of like seven trends to consider or 42 trends, blah, blah, blah. And the whole point of this is you're, you're getting a download of all the major trends that people see shaping the industry over the past couple of years. So you really understand what's top of mind for professionals, what is changing, what's exciting in the field. And so literally what I do is I would do this search that you see in front of you on the left hand side. And I would open the first, I'd, I'd open up a new link into a new tab, right? Just open up new tabs. And I'd go through the first five to 10 pages of Google search results. Like get really, really deep, like annoyingly deep through all these search results. And I'd have like a hundred different tabs. And then slowly throughout the day, just work my way one by one. And what I mean by work by way is I would just read through the page and then I copy paste any interesting trend into a Word doc or a Google doc on my computer and just have like a massive notes for myself. And so for example, I actually did this with my Netflix job uh, just two and a half years ago. I Google searched every single word our chief marketing officer at the time has ever said publicly. And I came up with a 60 page Word doc of just random copy pasted notes from the internet. And then what you do is after you're done with your research and I'll show you when you're done, you take, you condense that down into like a five to 10 page cliff notes version, which is like the most interesting stuff you found out, the stuff that you really gravitated towards. And that actually ends up being your interview guide. So when you meet professionals, when you interview for employers, you have this really tight fact base of the most interesting stuff online about your industry. And so I basically walked into the Netflix interview after two weeks of research with a five page cliff notes version memorized in my head about everything I learned online. And despite having no, no, like no marketing experience whatsoever, during those 20 or 30 minute conversations with Netflix professionals, I was able to sound you know, intelligent enough about what was going on in the marketing industry with Netflix just for that amount of time that people thought, you know what, hey, Sahil doesn't have any prior experience, but he seems to have the basic skill sets and he's really well, well read on like what's going on. Let's take a bet on him. And it worked out for me even five years after undergrad. So especially as new graduates, information is going to be your key to getting around the lack of experience. So I'm going to pause there because I know I said a lot. That's kind of the way to do Google search, quite simple. Just continue to search for like uh, industry trends 2020 or 2019, then open new tabs and just start reading through. Spend a couple hours reading through and copy pasting the most interesting stuff 
into a, into a separate document. I'm going to show you a couple of other ways to do this. On the right hand side, let's say you have an interview for Snapchat or you really want to work for Snapchat. Anytime you have an interview, actually, um, always Google search the company name beforehand in the Google News search box. It's always good to know, even if you just read the headlines, what's going on with the company. So at the time that I did this search, uh, as you all know or might know, TikTok is in some hot water right now. But if you're interviewing for Snapchat, it might be good to know that, hey, Snapchat is trying to take on TikTok style of, of navigation or content delivery. Like those are just good, sharp things to learn and know before entering an interview or talking to a professional at Snapchat because it'll give you good discussion uh, kind of uh, uh, foods, if you will, right? So things to talk about. Um, so this is one tactic that I would definitely highlight and recommend that you guys use for any interview that you have coming up as well as in your research phase. Just understand the company news and what's going on with them so you can have a more interesting, more recent discussion with them. And here's my favorite on the left hand side is YouTube. So I just Google uh, product or a YouTube product management undergraduate. You can do whatever career you want, like uh, healthcare or teacher or uh, investment banker or lawyer undergraduate. And you'll get a bunch of really cool videos of people saying, hey, what does it mean to be in this role? How do you actually get here? And I would just watch a couple of these videos and just kind of take notes in a similar fashion of, okay, these are the tips. These are the things that are valued. These are the skills I need. Um, again, Seems very simple, but because everything is so fragmented, that's a little bit of the hard part is you have to do the grunt work, what we call in consulting, boiling the ocean. Seems like you're trying to do everything. So you kind of have to just work your way through the research slowly and come up with your own cliffs notes and your own interview guide. And once you have that set of information, you're gonna sound like someone who's been in the industry for two to four years easy, it really works. Um, and so this is definitely an approach that's gonna help you multiple times throughout your life. And then on the right hand side, of course, you have Reddit. Someone wrote a computer science, a guide for undergrads and like how to think about recruiting and all this stuff. So there's just a really wide wealth of information available online to you. So definitely check out some of these resources that I told you and work your way through it. Now, here's the good news. You're all probably thinking this sounds like a lot of work. If your career hypothesis is genuinely something that you're interested in, this time is going to fly by like no other. It's going to be like your favorite subject to study in college. If you're working your way through this stuff and after like five minutes, you're like, screw this. I, I don't like any of this stuff. Then that's good. Chances are it's probably not the place where you want to put your eggs for your career right later on. So by doing this stuff early on, we can quickly figure out what's interesting to us and what we might need to recalibrate in terms of our career hypothesis before we commit further in terms of looking for an internship or job. So from your research, also, you should be able to build a list of potential roles and companies to apply to. I wouldn't worry about this too much for those of you listening and have access to the Career Launchpad. We walk through this in more detail in the course, but just know that generally speaking, as you're working your way through your research, like when you're watching videos on YouTube, you kind of want to understand what type of roles are available to an undergraduate in this industry. And then you want to learn in your research, what type of companies hire undergraduates. So it's like maybe you research Snapchat and you find out, hey, they actually have an undergraduate training program or an undergraduate program for recruiting. And, and that's a good thing to know. So just have a list of different things so that you can help yourself when it comes time to network. So I've kind of done the, the hard work for you and I've written an, an example curriculum for you to follow. And this is the easiest way that you can become an industry expert uh, in just one week of research. Um, so this is about four to six hours per day. You can split it over two weeks, three weeks, doesn't matter. But here's how you can do it in one week for those of you who are ambitious. So on Monday, I would basically understand, focus on what are the origins and history of my target industry? So how has the makeup industry evolved over the past couple of years? And, and what's the history behind it? Just kind of foundational stuff. On Tuesday, who are the major players in my target industry? What is the latest news on them, right? So if I want to work in tech, in social media, who are the major players? What's the latest news? If I want to work in digital advertising, who are the best agencies to work for? What is the latest news on them? On Wednesday, you want to specifically figure out who are the winners and the laggards in the industry. Um, so for example, I, I'm a huge car guy. Um, why is Tesla winning? Why are traditional automotive manufacturers not so in a not so great position? What's really behind that? If you're interested in working for Tesla, you should probably understand why they're winning, right? So just understanding what creates success in that industry. On Thursday, it's going to be spending time on what are key trends that have recently impacted my industry. So this is actually the example I gave you for Google, searching the industry trends 2019. So you're going to search for historical trends. And then on Friday, you're going to look for forward-looking trends. So over the next couple of years, what do people think is going to shape my industry, especially as it relates to COVID and the amount of change that's impacting so many different industries in today's world? 
And then Saturday, you can make it specific about career paths. So I've done a bunch of research Monday through Friday. I kind of know about my industry, but let me now dial it back down to, okay, I'm an undergraduate. What type of career paths are available to me in my target industry? And then Sunday is when you stop doing online research, you just look at your notes and you start to synthesize. What have I found most interesting? What do I like? What should I double down on? Or was this whole exercise kind of like, you know what, not for me, maybe I should look at another career hypothesis. So again, four to six hours a day, it is a lot, but in just seven days, you can become much, much sharper than probably a student on average who's just done one or two internships in the field. Um, it's, it really, really works just because of how much information there is available to you online. So you can move on to step three once you've found a career hypothesis that you might that you enjoy researching about. So again, there's only two outcomes after this process. Either your hypothesis is wrong, you did your research and you were like, you know what, not really for me, I'm going to change my focus. Or you went through the research and you were like, this is great. I love this stuff. Like I want to I want to double down on this stuff and, and have a career. Then we can move on to the next step. And speaking of the next step, um, now we can now that you've done the homework of like doing that industry research and making yourself sound like an expert. Now we can begin networking. And now you're going to be a lot more confident when you put yourself in front of professionals who you have no idea who they are. But because you know so much about their industry and their career, you're going to have an incredibly fun conversation with them. And we're going to talk about that in this next module. Erica, any, Eric, any questions in the chat? Cool. No questions at this time. Awesome. We're going no, super fast. You no, know, I did have um, a question for you, though. Mm -hmm. um, if you can go back to the weekly, um, yeah, slide. Um, so when, when, you know, folks are, are actually researching um, all of this information and asking themselves these questions, um, you know, how do you look out for sort of who the credible sources are and who aren't? Is that something that you'll just kind of notice off the bat and just go with your, your judgment? Or, you know, is there a way to find out like, when, when doing these searches and wanting to get accurate information, like how to look out for what's what's fake and what's actually legitimate? I mean, you don't trust random guy 44 on Reddit? <laughs> 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 no, that's a great question. And here's the cool thing, and this happens actually intuitively, which is why I didn't address it directly, but it's a great question, um, especially in today's world. What you're going to notice is when you start to do these Google searches and YouTube searches and Reddit searches, you're going to start to come across some key themes and some similarities. And in your notes, you're going to start to understand, okay, like multiple different sources have mentioned this one trend. So it seems like it's really important and credible. So chances are, if you read something and it sounds a bit outlandish or speculative, you just want to do a gut check and see, has this shown up anywhere else in my research online? Um, if so, you can probably give it a little bit of credibility. Obviously, everything online is still kind of uh, not 100% until you actually do the job. But that's where kind of doing the depth of research that I'm telling you here across the different platforms of Google, Google News, YouTube, and Reddit, you're going to start to see a common set of trends. And that's why at the end of this exercise, you might have like a really scrappy 20, 30 page document of just random clips, but you're going to be able to condense it down to the five pages of the most uh, commonly cited, most interesting trends that have the most kind of corroboration between the sources. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you. Great question. Do any, of, do any of the students have any other questions about what Sahil just went over? Don't be shy. We have a chat. You can, you can type it if you don't want to say it. <laughs> All right, I think, I think we'll, cool. we'll wait for the next wave, yeah. And for those of you watching after live, um, you know, feel free to enter the Facebook group chat and uh, answer your, ask your questions there. We're happy to help. All right, so networking to 10X your career, and my most students get it totally wrong. <clears throat> and this step you're going to transform in the following way, going from having no network uh, to having several professionals who advocate for your career. So this is actually one of my favorite stories. Um, for those of you who don't know, Chris Rock is a, is a really famous stand-up comedian, one of my favorites. And he had a great story that he told to Oprah a couple of years ago when he was an up and coming struggling comedian. And here's what he learned. So Chris Rock, when he was up and coming, uh, had a very broken car, as you can imagine. He didn't have a lot of money. And his car would always get broken down on the highway. And so he would 
pull his car over and try to push it, get out of the car and, and, and wave down to people on the side of the road to kind of help him. But no one ever stopped to help him. And he got really frustrated by this. And so one day he was driving on the highway and as usual, his car broke down, started to knock. And so he pulled over and he was so mad in that moment, he got out of the car and just started pushing the car himself. He didn't even wave to people. He was just like, you know what, I'm gonna do this myself and push the car. And at that moment, several drivers pulled over and actually got out of their car and helped Chris Rock push his car to the exit ramp. And Chris Rock told Oprah in that moment, he said, at that age, I learned that people love to help others who help themselves. People like to help people who help themselves. And that's probably the most important lesson that you guys can learn uh, when you're working on your career, especially as students, when you can play that student card, people love to help students, is you know a bad way to ask for help. The reason why we think networking is so icky and weird is because we're asking complete strangers for like vague things like, hey man, can you hook it up with a job? It's kind of weird, right? Um, and that's not really a good way to ask for help. Instead, think about, th think about it this way if you use the approach that we're telling you. Um, uh, hey, Jennifer, uh, I noticed that you work in the makeup industry. I'm a student at NDNU. I've done so much research on digital marketing, specifically in how makeup companies are using channels like Instagram to reach consumers directly and really show off their products and do all that cool stuff. Um, I'd love to grab coffee with you for 30 minutes to chat more about how you've done marketing at, at Ulta or Sephora and really learn how, how, what advice you would have for me as a student to get started in that career. Like, obviously, that's super rough. I just made it up. But look how specific that request is, right? It shows you that you really did your homework. It tells Jennifer, the theoretical person, that you're with some someone helping because you actually pushed your own car, so to speak, you have a more specific request. So I think the lesson from this slide and one that you definitely want to remember after this call is there is a direct correlation between how much someone is able to help you and how specific you are with your request for help. So a bad way to ask for job advice is, hey man, can you get me a job? A good way is to do the industry research, have an informed hypothesis, go to your NDNU staff, go to your professional alumni network, come to me even uh, with a specific request for help that shows that you're pushing your own car. So a really cool lesson from Chris Rock that I think can tell us all about just success in life in general, but more specifically how to build your career. And he's an awesome comedian. <laughs> so again, uh, get professionals to help you push your car, AKA your career, if you didn't get the analogy, um, through coffee chats and phone conversations. And there's a couple benefits to this. You can become a better industry expert and learn quickly. So Erica, to your question around, how do you know if a source is credible online? You're completely right. You, you don't know fully. So the best way is to actually talk to professionals who are in the industry and you can learn from them firsthand. Secondarily, it'll allow you to establish mentor-mentee relationships with people who you like, who you want to be like someday. So you can reach out to people who are five years older than you, 10 years older than you that are doing cool things that you want to do, and you can actually have them champion your career. And most importantly, you can uncover hidden job opportunities that aren't posted anywhere online. And actually, most of the jobs, over 80% of them are never publicly posted. And I'll show you some real life example of how this happened for my brother at LinkedIn. It's actually really cool behind the scenes of how it actually works in terms of having these hidden job opportunities come up. So actually here it is. <laughs> Rohan moved it up in the presentation. Here's an actual LinkedIn conversation that happens behind closed doors. So all of you know how this works in the real world. Um, so this guy named Unshuk was asking my brother Rohan, um, hey, I'm looking for a business development person with a background in education. Do you know of anyone? I'm also planning to hire this other person soon. And on the right-hand side, you'll see Rohan responded, hmm, I kind of know a guy, don't know a guy. Maybe I can think about it. And Unshuk's like, that would be great, thanks. Um, and Unshuk was like, um, you know, we're looking for this kind of qualification and this kind of experience. And Rohan's like, great, I'll have a look. And look at the green underline here. Thanks, but no job is posted online yet. And that's the key. This is how most of the jobs, especially the highest paying and the most fun jobs get filled in corporate America, is it happens through networking. So notice if Rohan had shown Unshuk one or two people that he thought were great fits, that job posting would have never made it to Handshake or University's job portal. It would have been already filled. And I can tell you for all the positions that I found in my career, both at Netflix and at Discovery, and for my brother, we found it because we got ahead of this and we got it through our network. And notice that when Rohan, let's say Rohan recommended me for the position, I would have to show a resume, but I don't have to compete with that stack of 250 other people because Unshook already trusts Rohan. So again, building your network and building a champion of people who are going to advocate for your career um, is gonna be really key to getting access to these secret opportunities. And frankly, as something, you know, 
Ron and I are really passionate about um, socioeconomic mobility and, and, and the issues of how privilege gets involved with careers. And, and this is why a lot of Ivy League students are able to get top jobs because they have those connections already. And so this is just a way for you to replicate that success in your own world for your own industry. So this is just what happens behind the scenes. Maybe you can replace Anshuk with a mom or dad type figure, but it doesn't matter. You can recreate it for yourself just like Rohan and I did. This is kind of how you really access that powerful network that shows you, again, these roles are, are very high paying roles. This is just how it works. Even in your 20s, even in your 30s, you probably want to look for a job that's never posted online because it's going to be the most exciting one that's the most in demand. All right. So how do you actually build your network? We're going to use LinkedIn. And this is a free resource. So basically what you can do is if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, I highly encourage you to create one. You don't have to build it out. Just create one. Just say create. And you don't even have to have the picture or whatever to use this first step. And once you create your profile, you're going to have access to people search. So you can click on the search box here. And just another caveat, we're going to show you how to do this step by step in the course. I'm just going through the high level notes here. Um, and what you can do is you can search the entire LinkedIn database by um, different types of things, by companies, by schools, by industries, by locations. So you can type in school NDNU, for example. And uh, I know Oracle recently visited campus, so we can type in Oracle here. And you can click search, apply. And on the right-hand side, you'll get a list of people that fall under that criteria, people who went to NDNU who now work at Oracle. And that's basically a list of alumni that you can reach out to if you're interested in working at Oracle, for example. So in this case, my brother did a search for, I think, product people at tech companies who went to UC Berkeley, so his alumni. And I mean, look how many cool people there are. People at Facebook, Airbnb, Yelp, DocuSign, another Facebook person. These are all cool people for him to reach out to. And there's 1,900 results, so we can refine this even further. So again, this is a way that you can splice and dice. Imagine with LinkedIn, you have access to every single person's resume in the professional world. That's pretty cool. We haven't had that for too long, so people don't really know how to use it. This is one creative way that you can use that information. And again, the specific tip that I want you guys to remember here is to use NDNU as a school filter here because you're gonna be able to find alumni specifically. And that's gonna be really important when it comes time to reach out to people. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about that in a moment. Um, you should come up with a list of 40 to 50 professionals to reach out to. So again, 40 to 50 people who seem interesting. Um, and then you can reach out to them. Now, in the course, we're gonna show you how to reach out to them, the templates and all that. For those of you who are curious, you can Google search two by twenty-two cold emailing. 2 by 22 is a blog that my brother started and he has a full in-depth long form article that gives you the exact template you can use to reach out to people. Um, and so basically, here's a deal with InMail. InMail is like direct messaging, it's like an Instagram DM, but for LinkedIn. Um, the thing is, uh, LinkedIn InMail costs money. So it's basically $30 a month. And with that, you get five InMail credits. And so that means five times that you can message someone. Now, when you use an in-mail credit, you send a message to me, let's say, and we're not connected. Um, if I don't respond within seven days, you get that credit back. So you're basically guaranteed to hear back from at least five people a month with that $30 plan. Now, obviously, that costs some money, and so there's a couple ways to get around it. You can either find their email address online and reach out to them, or simply enough, if you just connect with the person first on LinkedIn, and once we're an established connection, then you can message back and forth as much as you want. So a lot of students get around this hack of just connecting with a stranger. You can even add a note saying, hey, I'm a student at NDNU, saw your profile, thought it was interesting. Hope that they accept it. Most likely they will. And then you can message them unlimited so you don't need any kind of paid plan. So whatever works for you, but definitely recommend uh, direct messaging people, DMing people on LinkedIn is a great way to get in touch. And then some kind of notes to caveat here. Uh, Erica, you had a question? Uh, sorry, we have a question in the chat about LinkedIn. Before you move sure. on, um, the question is, will there be a presentation or module specifically about navigating LinkedIn? Yes. <clears throat> We're going to show you a behind the shoulder view of how to actually use LinkedIn in the course. Cool. Um, and we'll probably actually cover that in a webinar topic, guys. I think uh, Eric and Erica, that might be a good one for us to, to program. So look out for that. Um, LinkedIn masterclass. Um, anyway, so some guidelines here. Uh, the last bullet point is really important to remember. So let's keep in mind, this is basically cold emailing strangers. They might be alumni, but at the end of the day, they're still strangers. So here's some points to, to data points to calibrate your expectations. For every five messages you send to complete strangers, you should expect to hear back once. 
that's about a 20% conversion rate. One yes for every five messages. Now, if you reach out to alumni of NDNU, that should double. So two out of every five or 40%. So no, even in the best scenario, when you're reaching out to alumni, 60% of the time, you're not going to hear back. That's totally okay. It's just a reality of you reaching out to people who you don't know. So just don't get disheartened if you don't get a response back. Just know that's the norm and keep trying and keep getting at it. And, and this is where the work hard and smart approach really comes into play because for every message that you send, you increase your likelihood. And I promise you just having one 30 minute conversation with a professional can change your life so much um, in terms of how much they can help you, but also how much they can tell you about the career and the industry. So these are really valuable conversations to have. And in the module actually for this, we go over the exact questions to ask, some interview etiquette, how to actually set up a coffee chat or a phone call, um, and how to do all the tactical stuff that you're probably asking yourself. So again, the point of this webinar is just the high level broad strokes of how to do this. Oh, and we go into some detail here. During the 30 minute call that you have with a professional, you can discuss the following. So you're gonna spend five minutes just telling them about yourself, your elevator pitch, and setting up the agenda for what you'd like to discuss. Uh, you can spend the next 20 minutes talking about their career specifically. Oh, like I saw you went to Oracle from NDNU. How did you navigate that? What are some things impacting your industry? Um, you know, and focus on being present and taking the conversation wherever it goes. And then the last five minutes, you're gonna ask specific questions and actionable advice that you can execute on. So look at the trend here. It's a 30 minute call, but only the last five minutes are spent asking for advice, meaning 25 minutes of the call are spent talking about each other's careers, talking about the industry trends that you've done in that industry trend step that we talked about earlier, just stuff that's interesting to show that you're curious and you're someone worth taking a bet on. And then in the last five minutes, you're gonna ask for specific advice. So now, if you made it this far in the webinar, you know that I hate the question, can you hook it up with a job? Instead, you're gonna ask for really specific advice. And here's the key. You wanna ask for advice that you can literally do tomorrow. So the way that you ask that is, hey, if you were in my shoes, you're, I'm a junior at NDNU, what steps would you take to actually be in your shoes down the road? Well, like, what can you do tomorrow? And if someone says, oh, you're young, you're, you're sharp, just stay at it, you'll, you'll be fine. That's terrible advice, always push them for further. What you wanna push for is something like, well, you wanna join this one student group at NDNU, or you wanna actually contact the alumni or the career services department and have them do X, Y, Z for you, or you wanna to apply to this type of role. So specific actionable advice that you can actually execute on. Now, um, when I basically, when I tell people this and why it's so important to get actionable advice, the most common question I get for students who actually build a network with professionals is they say, well, Sahil, I talked to someone like three months ago. How do I stay in touch with them? Like, how do I keep them updated? Here's the thing. You don't want to send them like monthly emails about your grades or, or what's going on in your life. Um, the best way to do that organically is by showing updates on your career. So if you took actionable advice from this guy named John, he told you to join the student group at NDNU and have a certain internship experience for the summer go off and do that. If it takes a couple days, a couple weeks, even a couple months, just do take his advice. And when you see some kind of benefit to your career, your life, then you can reach back out to John and say, hey, John, this is that student you talked to at NDNU a couple months ago. Um, I don't know if you remember, but you told me to join the student group and actually apply for these types of internships. I actually went ahead and did that and got this internship and it's been an amazing experience. Just wanted to thank you for your help and look forward to staying in touch. And just that simple message reestablishes the connection, but then also makes John feel so great about taking time out of his day to help you because he feels like he's a real mentor in your career. And by doing that, you set yourself up to get even more advice for John. So that when it comes time to look for that full-time job, you can reach out to John just organically because you have that communication back and forth. And you can say, hey, John, I'm finally ready to look for a full-time job at Oracle. Um, here's a couple positions I was interested in applying to. Would you be able to flag my resume to the recruiter because you know how serious I am about my career? So if you do this several dozen times with different professionals, uh, I want you all to have, um, you know, a couple dozen John and Jennifer's in your career that you can reach out to by the end of your NDNU graduation. So if you're a freshman or sophomore, you certainly have time to build this up. If you're a senior or recent graduate, no worries. You can start this now and you have the entire year ahead of you and even after you graduate to do this process. So like I said before, you should aim to have at least two to three professional chats for every week that you're unemployed. And that basically amounts to just a, full, a few cold emails or we're reaching out a day uh, mathematically. And again, the secrets of maintaining relationships with mentors is to update them whenever you make a major career move. So here's what I do. Every time I get a new role or a, a, a new promotion, I reach back out to my contact list of everyone who's ever helped me in my career and I just send them an email saying exciting update. 
I, I tell them the update, how great, you know, it is for my career and then thank them for any advice they gave me historically, because it makes them feel continually invested in my career. And of course, I'll help them whenever they need. So always attribute part of your success to people who help you along the way. All right, so now let's apply to jobs in a way that actually gets results and gets you stood out. So I'm gonna pause here again. Any questions in the chat? Okay. And uh, I know we're at the three minute mark here before four o'clock, but we're gonna go a little bit over just to cover some of these things. So no worries if people have to drop, this will be recorded. All right, so in this step, we're gonna go from getting stuck in the pile of resumes and never hearing back to dramatically increasing your odds of a real person reviewing your application. So remember, uh, the, the dreaded application funnel. The average application has a success rate of just 0.4%, not good. And at the same time, we talked about how 80% of jobs are filled by networking and are never posted publicly. So it's also true that most people are getting interviews because they get some type of an inside nudge by the company, meaning they get their resume flagged by someone who works at the company or by the recruiter as something to must review or must interview. And, and just applying to jobs online is too easy. So you need to be different and stand out from the noise. So we have a saying at the Career Launchpad, cold apps are dead apps. If you just click upload and submit on your resume to job postings and don't do anything else, you should expect to not hear back just because of so many inflated job applications for a position. You have to do a lot more steps to actually get noticed. So we, we talk about converting your cold application into a warm application for the recruiter by making yourself stand out. So if you've kind of gotten frustrated of applying to dozens and dozens of jobs online through your job portal um, and not hearing back, this is why. It's because just there's so many applications in today's world, a good resume is no longer enough. You really need to have someone inside the company advocating for your career. So how do you do that? Here's, here's the five steps. Number one, you're gonna reach out to a current employee. So you should have already done this in the informational interview phase, but let's say you come across a position in Oracle uh, that you wanna apply for. You can reach out to an alumni at NDNU, um, of NDNU to, uh, who works at Oracle and schedule a coffee chat with them, talk more about that opportunity, talk more about why you're interested in it, just so you make that connection and, and, and tell them that you're applying to this job down the road so they know it's on their radar. Then in the second step, you wanna beat the resume algorithm. Now, what do I mean by this? There's two types of algorithms or ways that people determine whether or not your resume is a yes or a no. There's a human algorithm. So the average person spends six seconds looking at a resume, that's it. And as you can imagine, they're looking for keywords, right? So if you look at the job posting, the job description, you wanna make sure that some of those keywords are in your resume somewhere if you have that experience. Obviously don't just arbitrarily put it in there, um, but you wanna make sure that you're talking about the same skills that they're looking for or that you have the same type of experience if you're able to do that. And then also that'll help you beat the machine algorithm. So a lot of bigger companies like Facebook, Google, and Amazon, they use automated, what we're gonna call ATS, applicant tracking systems, where they have your PDF resume and they scan it through some kind of a machine learning software. And it just picks up whether your resume is good or not based on the number of keywords that, that hit the job description. So it's like an automated way of doing that. Um, so both the human algorithm and the resume algorithm, the, or the, the uh, applicant tracking system. These are ways that you can get around it. So the second step here is to make sure that your resume contains some of the buzzwords from the job description. And then number three, you want to personalize a cover letter. If the job asks for a cover letter, definitely mention anyone that you talk to at the company and then spend four to six sentences of the cover letter talking about why you want to work for that company specifically. And a good test for you to do here is after you wrote your cover letter, take out the company name and replace it with another company name. So take out Oracle and replace it with Amazon. And if it reads perfectly still, it's not a good enough cover letter. It needs to be specific enough where it wouldn't make sense if you replace that company's name with another company name. And for those of you who are asking more about cover letter stuff, we're going to cover this in a detailed module in the Launchpad course. So we're going to cover it in more detail there. The next step, uh, step number four, is to actually submit your app online. So actually apply online. Um, and you can also submit your application via snail mail. So via FedEx, printing it out is a good kind of nice touch. This might be a bit limited in, in, in the days of COVID because people aren't in the office. So save this tip for a little bit later on. And then step five is a cool pro tip that I use. So get flagged by an employee. We already talked about reaching out to someone that you talked to at Oracle who went to NDNU. Let them know that you applied to the job and that if there's any way that they can flag your resume as someone to must interview or consider, that'd be great. <clears throat> Here's another tip that you guys can do. Um, if you have a career services or alumni department that you're connected to, try to find um, the recruiter's name 
of the position uh, for the company that you're interviewing for and try to get your career services department or professional development department to send an email on their behalf introducing you to the recruiter. So you can say something like to your counselor, um, hey, you know, I really want to work at Oracle. Um, this person is a recruiter. I'm really serious about the job. Here's the research that I've done. I wanted to know if you can send an email to the recruiter on my behalf, just showing my interest and, and attaching my resume as well. And, and the way you want to do this is not by sending a list of 100 different postings and having your professional development department do that for you. They're not. They don't have the bandwidth, I'm sure. Um, but what I'm sure they're able to do is for one or two positions that you're really passionate about, that you feel really strong that you're a good fit for, having that email address come from an NDNU staff member is going to be so much different than just a random cold student randomly reaching out. So those are one of the cool tips and tricks that you can use is being part of an NDNU student, really part of an institution um, by getting that institution's name to advocate for your, for your career. But again, it's really important that you show that you've done the homework and that to the person that you're asking help for, make sure that you're actually that what you, th you feel that you're the best position for best person for the jobs because you have to kind of, empathize with them and understand that, hey, if they're getting requests from like 50 different students, they're not going to recommend everyone, right? So you really want to position yourself well for a few types of positions and then have the institution reach out on your behalf. So that's a lot, um, five steps for every job. Um, as you can probably imagine, Rohan and I are not a fan of applying to dozens and dozens of jobs and, and just kind of going through the strokes. We would rather you apply to less than a dozen jobs, but do this step comprehensively, steps one through five, and really kind of understand the processes that are involved because you're going to have a lot higher success rate and you're going to meet a lot of cooler people and you might even come across job opportunities you never even knew existed because if someone likes you through the interview process chances are there's going to be an interview internship opportunity down the road or a full-time job opportunity in another department and so those are things to consider and that's especially true for those of you who are going through this covid period yes internships are being taken down internships are being postponed. So communicating yourself as someone who is likable, who is serious about their career, who has a long-term game in mind, you're gonna be able to build richer relationships with recruiters and professionals by not being so short-term sighted. So this is again, step one through five of making your application really stand out from the rest of the students who are just applying online. So yeah, smart and hard, but the payoff is 10 times better in our estimation. <clears throat> and of course, the amount of effort you put into this step will directly correlate to the number of interview opportunities you get because interview opportunities come from the number of job applications that you submit in a very thorough way. And speaking of which, that's going to be step five. So I'm going to pause here for a water break. If we have any questions in the chat, uh, let me know. No questions, but um, let's see. About how much longer, Sohil? Um, it's going to be about 10 minutes longer. Is that okay? Okay, okay so for folks who um, need to tap out, um, please, before you leave, give uh, Sahil a round of applause so that <laughs> we know that you're <laughs> here. Um, and then, um, yeah, hopefully everyone else can, can stick around for the rest of the, the remaining of the, the webinar. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. <clears throat> All right, so last step here. I know we're going through a lot. <laughs> so this step you're gonna transform in the following way. Go from maybe being nervous about interviewing or establishing that first impression to interviewing like a rock star with, with super confidence. So most interviews that you have as a college student are gonna follow the following breakdown. Five minutes of small talk, 10 minutes of what we call behavioral questions, 10 minutes of technical questions, really challenging your critical thinking skills, and then five minutes for you to ask questions to the uh, recruiter or the interviewer. So in terms of behavioral questions, which is where we're gonna focus our time today, again, in the course, we go through all of these. There's a couple of different flavors. Tell me about yourself. Why do you wanna work for this company? Uh, tell me something specific about your resume. Tell me some personal experience or leadership questions leadership opportunities that you had, and then some questions and answers generically about your personality and your, your experience. So for now, we're going to focus on showing you how to do these two things. Tell me about yourself and answering leadership questions. So the secret to nailing tell me about yourself, which is the most misunderstood question of all, is, is kind of a couple of things. <clears throat> Number one, the litmus test should be 
like after the end of your one minute, two minute response to this question, and this can be walk me through your resume or tell me about yourself, it should sound like you were born for this job, like your entire life led up to this moment, led up to this interview. Um, and so basically you can craft a concise two minute story with your unique value prop and one or two brief examples. So what makes you unique? What makes you especially curious about this opportunity? And can you give some examples of how you've demonstrated that curiosity? And you want to wrap up with at the end of your pitch, you should have these exact words. And that's why I'm here today, because what it does is really forces you to think about your entire life journey to that moment when you're in front of the recruiter for that position. And of course, you want to strike a balance between being pitching and conversational. No one likes to try hard, but you are in an interview. So you do have to kind of, you know, sell yourself, uh, but you don't have to be, you know, a, a late night TV infomercial person. You can just like have a conversation with someone about your experiences, really strike that natural tone. And again, we show you how to do all this in the course. So here's an advanced tip as well. You want to preempt their objections and address it with your narrative directly. So what do I mean by this? When you're crafting your two minute story, look at your application and really think objectively. What's the biggest red flag of my, of my application? Do I not have enough experience? Um, do I not have the right major? Or do I have a low GPA if that's important to certain careers? And you wanna make sure that you address that before the other person even gets to ask you about it because it'll show that you're super self-aware and that you're just getting ahead of their expectations and you, and you have that thought process in mind and you have a story for it. So that's just a pro tip to make your, your personal story even better and more compelling is to try to think about what objections would someone have to actually hiring you and try to address that in your narrative specifically. And so as a litmus test, it should take you a couple of hours to prepare your tell me about yourself response. This is not something that you figure out in five minutes of just, oh, well, I grew up in this town and I went to NDNU and this is why I'm here today. It should be a lot more detailed, but again, less than two minutes. So it's something you really have to perfect. But the good thing is, once you do this once, it's generally applicable to any type of job that you're interviewing for with some minor tweaks. So it's a good one-time investment. And again, in the course, we show you how to do this in detail. Rohan goes into so much detail about how to do this bullet by bullet. So now the next type of questions are personal experience questions. I'm sure you've heard of this before. It's like, tell me about a time when you've led or you've failed or you've persuaded a group of people. There are an endless number of ways people can ask you these types of questions. And it's impossible to figure out the hundred different permutations and combinations of different questions they can ask you. So instead of preparing for the specific question, here's a hack actually just have two to three stories in your back pocket from your experience and adapt them to the questions during the interview. So generally speaking, if you have these three types of stories, you're going to be fine. Tell me about a time when you led. Tell me about a time when you failed completely. And then tell me about a time when you had to persuade a group of people. If you have a story for each one of those things, no matter what the question is here, you're going to be able to adapt it in real time to, to fulfill that need. It's really cool how it works, but this is just what Rohan and I have noticed over the years. So again, don't get caught up in preparing for individual questions here. Think of the two to three most exciting stories that you've had. And if you don't have any stories, go out and get experience, so you do, um, with a student group or whatever, and start to kind of shape your life narrative about things that you've gone through as a student. And then you can use the following framework. I won't go into too much detail for time, but just know that this framework is here. I think the most important thing that you'd address in every question is by stating the learn lesson directly. So tell me about a time when you failed. You would start the story with, okay, well, let me t tell you about a time when I was doing a group project for NDNU and uh, didn't and learned the hard way the importance of communication and time management. So right away you're answering the question and then you're going to the story. I can't tell you how many times students go off to like a 12 minute narrative about this situation and they don't even answer the, the freaking question. So you're gonna make sure you get ahead of it by addressing the question first, by stating your answer. Then you, you know, go through the story bullet points. I'm not gonna go through that. Then the last bullet point you see on your screen is by restating the learn lesson directly again. So you start with the learn lesson. I learned the importance of time management and communication. You go through the story and then at the end you say, and that experience really taught me the importance of communication and time management. And I look forward to taking that lesson with me in my, for, in my future jobs. So that's kind of how a way that you would neatly package any kind of life story that you have about your experience. So here's how you know you nailed it. It's a very concise and structured answer. Keep it around two to three minutes. In general, none of your interview answers for your first job out of college should be more than three minutes. You should be able to answer every single interview question in under three minutes. It's actually quite a long time. So just a good benchmark for you if you're gonna time yourself or practice. Um, make sure that the stories are adaptable and can be used for multiple questions. We talked about that. You wanna use I liberally. This is not the time to be humble. So don't, you don't wanna say, you don't wanna have an entire story where your friend figures out the answer and learns a lesson. You, you wanna make this about yourself, right? Uh, of course, you wanna address the question directly. 
Uh, you can throw in learnings for bonus points. And this basically means this is the time when I learned the importance of communication and project management. Just stating those things really makes you seem like you're professional development oriented and be ready to go deep. People might ask you for specific details. Well, what did you mean by you, by you said this or what happened here? Just be prepared to recount that experience um, as anyone would be curious. So preparing for personal experience questions takes a fair amount of time, but once you do, it'll pay off for every interview you do, we promise. It's our favorite part of the job process. I interview for fun just to kind of work on my skills, and uh, it really can be a fun part of the process once you understand and internalize your own life story and also have a career hypothesis that you're really passionate about, that you just love talking about the industry with other people. All right. We made it through. <laughs> wow, that was a lot. Uh, we went through a lot of steps here. Number one, how to overcome the anxiety about figuring out your dream career, that idea of a career hypothesis. Number two, we talked about how to overcome that meme of two to four years of work experience for this entry level position by becoming an industry expert. Then we talked about how to actually network to 10x your career by finding those hidden job opportunities. In the second to last step, we talked about how the five step process that you need to follow when applying to every job. And then lastly, we talked about some interview secrets to nailing interviews and standing out from the competition. Again, our online course goes into so much more detail for the interview part. So you've now learned the step-by-step -step process that Rohan and I have used with hundreds of other students across the country to land their next internship or job in any field. So at this point, you have two options. You can either try to go it alone and, not, and after watching this webinar, just try to figure it out on your own, or you can learn the proven step-by-step -step process that we've used as career coaches to help students like you navigate this incredibly tumultuous time that is a job market. And remember, it takes an average three to six months for students to find a job, and we can get you there in just a couple of weeks with the process that we've used if you're diligent about the process. So at this point, we'd of course like to introduce the Career Launchpad, which many of you are already familiar with. Um, and basically, it's how to land a job or internship in a highly competitive industry in as little as 42 days. It's over 21 modules that covers everything in extreme detail, uh, recorded videos like these, templates, best practices, behind the shoulder demonstrations. You can access it anywhere, anytime, on any device, just like an online course. And this covers so many modules. I'm not going to go through all of these, but it goes into so much detail about every aspect of your job search. So this is your one-stop resource that NDNU has made available to you. So really, really cool to have this for the first time. And this program is available for students. Typically, we charge $397. But as an NDNU student, if you use the link below in the chat, it's absolutely free, so 100% off. Um, and, and such a great deal and such a great return on your time. And again, these are principles that are going to help you even as graduate students and beyond in your 30s as well. So uh, get started now for free uh, by clicking on the link in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and post it again just for reference. And if you have any questions, we can answer them now. Um, and if you're on the fence, it's totally cool. Uh, we do surveys about how students receive our program and our NPS or a satisfaction score is 100%. You can see some of the bullet points here if you wanna pause and watch it later on. Um, you know, I think my favorite quote here is, this course was super helpful, great for people who wanna get straight to the point, no flowery language or BS. Um, as you can imagine, we're kind of really to the point. We don't put any flowery language. We kind of really show you what's worked for Rohan and I, and so you can get those results. And of course, Rohan and I get bombarded on LinkedIn every day from students who have taken the course. And we want you to be one of them telling us about your success. Um, so again, uh, here's the link in the chat. And I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen so we can answer some questions if we have time. Uh, Rosella, Eric, Erica. If you have any questions, Laura, if you have any questions or thoughts or feedback, let me know. We can let the recording go for another couple of minutes and then I'll go ahead and save and upload it. Yeah, um, how, uh, what, what's the like the turnaround when, um, I know that you said these are recorded, but like for folks that maybe have missed it or couldn't make it because of class or something like that, um, sure. how, uh, what's the <clears throat> turnaround time for like to get those recordings um, sent out to students? Yeah, so uh, here's what I'll do. I will, it'll take me a couple minutes to download it to my computer. I'll upload it to a Google Drive and share that link with uh, Eric and Erica. Now, the thing is uh, that link will have to then be downloaded and stored on an NDNU server because it's now NDNU owns that content. And so they wanna make it available to you. I don't know how you guys wanna do it on your career page or on an email to people who register for this webinar but couldn't attend, totally fine. And you can kind of send the link there. Um, so that's what I can do on my end. Let me know if that works for you or not. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, I should be able to have a link to you guys uh, within a couple hours, probably by end of day. Cool. 
Looks like we had everyone stick around too. Thanks everyone. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and what's really cool and what's really innovative about what ND and &E was doing <laughs> is we're not only offering the online course, obviously for you guys to use, um, it, it's going to be supplemented by these monthly webinars. So feel free to join these. You're going to see the Career Launchpad webinar series on your calendars every month. Um, you'll see notices go out. Tell your friends about it because I'm sure many of your friends couldn't attend during this time. We really want to make it as popular as possible to help students out. And anytime you have questions about putting these things into practice, you can use these forums to ask me directly about your specific situation. We'll really troubleshoot your, your problems uh, to get you the results we need. So it's really supplementing that online course with the in-person coaching that you need to get the results that you want. Um, and then I'll just say one other thing. I think the biggest thing that stops people from getting the success that they want is a lack of urgency. So many of you are, are gonna have watched this webinar. I mean, you already, kudos for joining this because many people didn't. Um, but if you're watching this now or after the fact, I, I think many of you might be thinking, oh cool, I have course access. Um, I'm gonna watch it after the winter semester when things are better. Um, you you wanna go through it now, especially while things are a bit difficult and you have some downtime maybe um, working from home or, or doing class from home. Um, because I think in times of tragedy, you really wanna take that opportunity to position yourself well, learn a new skill, learn how to recruit so that when the job market opens back up as it is already starting to do, you can hit the ground running and be one of those students that's ahead of the curve. So I think the biggest thing that trips up students is there's a real lack of urgency, unless you're a recent graduate who is like, maybe you have student loans, you have other bills piling up and that's the urgency. Um, I hope that you don't have to get to that level. So for those of you who haven't graduated yet and are watching this, highly encourage you to start the course today. And again, working through it at your own pace. So I, hear, I have a question. Sure. Uh, for some jobs applications, uh, they say like, for example, uh, you need to have uh, uh, two or three years experience. And if I'm not, what should I do? Should I apply anyway? Yeah, so here's the thing uh, with those type of job postings, which is a lot of them, if you just apply with your resume and your resume doesn't show that you have two to three years of experience, you're not gonna get called back, right? And so the way to circumvent that is by trying to figure out if it's at a company or an institution, um, try to find someone who works there through LinkedIn or through your alumni database and try to get in touch with them and tell them your story and why are you interested? So Claudia, you don't have any years of experience, but why are you interested in that position? And by telling that person your story, sharing your passion and the industry research you've done already, if you've done that week of research that I talked about, you're gonna come across as someone who is like super passionate and determined and worth taking a bet on. And then that person at the company can say, oh, Claudia, like you're gonna see her resume. She's, she doesn't have any experience, but, but she's one to interview because I've talked to her personally. So that's how you get around it is by actually getting someone at the company to hear your story. And unfortunately we can't communicate communicate that well enough on a resume because it's just bullet points and cover letters aren't good either. It's really that in-person connection that you need to make. So again, um, especially that demonstrates perfectly why just applying to jobs online without any kind of follow-up is going to probably not get you many results, especially when you don't have the right experience. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course. Awesome. Well, I think Eric, Erica and everyone else, we can, we can end the call now. Again, the course link is there on the right-hand side. If you have any issues accessing, you can see my email here. And for those of you watching after the fact, you'll have access to this chat as well. You can see my screen. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and conclude and we will stay in touch with the next monthly webinar series and the topic TBD. And uh, if anyone has any questions about their career, join the Facebook group um, and uh, we will stay in touch over there. Thank you so much, Sahil. Um, everyone else, um, stay tuned for our following webinar. Um, but also, please, just a quick announcement. Every week, you'll get sent a, um, a newsletter in your student email from marketing telling you which events are going on this week. So whether it's career, programming, or just things that you need to know for the campus, just be on the lookout for those. And I just pasted a link to the uh, Career Launchpad group on Facebook, so you oh. can request access, and uh, I will admit you to that group. Sorry, Erica, you're gonna say? No, thank you, Sahil. Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Sahil, so much um, for getting us going in this first webinar and um, for working with us and getting this module, this is these important modules and topics to our students. Um, and we really do appreciate all the efforts and and uh, information and 
Um, even I learned something new today. So hopefully, you know, <laughs> um, uh, you know, students have a takeaway. And um, I think uh, as we move forward, we'll be able to really kind of get more into depth of these things and um, hopefully have um, more interaction and questions and going on moving forward. Um, but thank you so much uh, for taking the time out of your day and, and doing this. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Glad to do it. And again, everyone, um, special thanks to Andy and you for piloting this program, being very forward thinking. And uh, we think it couldn't have come at a better time, fortunately and unfortunately. So we're here to help uh, even virtually. We want to see you get that success. So uh, yeah, looking forward to staying in touch with everyone. Take care. <laughs> thanks, Claudia. See you guys. Bye. Bye.